Hi friends, this is Mark Fox with another edition of Amazing Prophecies. In 2004, director-producer Mel Gibson released a movie depicting the last 12 hours of Jesus' life. The Passion of the Christ earned over $370 million at the domestic box office, making it the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time and the highest grossing foreign language film released in the U.S. In Mel Gibson's movie, the horrors of Jesus' crucifixion were portrayed in vivid color. Indeed, the Romans had perfected crucifixion as a punishment designed to maximize pain and suffering. It wasn't just about killing, it was about draining out the victim's life in a slow, horrible way. It was thought of as the most humiliating and disgraceful form of execution. It was usually reserved for the vilest of criminals. The movie stirred millions with sympathy for Jesus. Nevertheless, here is a sobering fact. Through the centuries, there have been thousands and even hundreds of thousands of people who were crucified just like Jesus. So the question begs to be asked, what is so special or unique about Jesus' death? Wasn't Jesus only one of many martyrs throughout the ages? Why should his death matter to me? Let us share seven incredible facts why Jesus' death was unlike any other in history. Number one, Jesus' death was accompanied by supernatural signs. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, suspended between heaven and earth, eventually a strange, ominous, thick darkness enveloped the cross. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land, Matthew 27, verse 45. It was so pronounced that there was no mistaking precisely when it began and when it was lifted. Also the veil in the holy temple separating the holy place from the most holy place was miraculously torn from top to bottom. Then behold the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This was amazing confirmation that Jesus was indeed the true Lamb of God, sacrificed for sinners, and now there was no longer a need for animal sacrifices. Simultaneously, Matthew says, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after the, his resurrection. Matthew 27, 51 and 52. Number two, Jesus stood accused of the guilt of all mankind. While praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was arrested, Jesus cried out in desperation, My Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. What was in this mysterious cup that Jesus had to drink from? The cup that Jesus drank from contained something unfathomably darker, deeper, infinitely more dreadful than anything anyone had ever experienced before. The Bible tells us, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. In this horrible cup was the guilt of every one of Adam's descendants. Yes, every human being from the beginning of time. Upon Jesus were heaped every act of debauchery, depravity, deceit, greed, hypocrisy, abuse, adultery, avarice, extortion, exploitation, gluttony, fraud, treachery, child abuse, lust, perversion, bloodshed, blackmail, betrayal, bigotry, and bribery that has ever been committed throughout history. As the author of the classic book on the life of Christ, The Desire of Ages writes, so dreadful does sin appear to him, so great is the weight of guilt which he must bear, that he is tempted to fear it will shut him out forever from his Father's love. Feeling how terrible is the wrath of God against transgression, he exclaims, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep, that his spirit shuddered before it. After a struggle, which we will never understand fully, his mind was made up 
And he declared with quivering lips, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Luke 22, verse 42. As Jesus surrendered his will to his Father's will, he braced himself for the worst, a torrent of demons to be unleashed mercilessly upon him as his Father removed his protective presence and light from his Son. Which leads us to fact number three. Jesus endured the wrath of God. God reveals himself to us in his word as a God of love, but part of that love is his justice. If, for example, your son rebels against all authority, engages in crime, including harming your other children, what would you do? Would you shelter him or would you allow him to reap the consequences of his behavior? Because of your love for all your children, you wouldn't have any other choice but to allow him to suffer the consequences. God is holy and his wrath against sin is fierce because it is the cause of all the pain, suffering, and death that has plagued this world for over 6,000 years. The subject of God's wrath is sin and its author, Satan himself. Since Jesus, as the substitute for all of mankind, has become sin, he is the recipient of this wrath to an extent that no other human will ever have to endure. You are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, Romans 2 verse 5. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off, Psalms 88 verse 15. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Nahum 1 verse 6. While the natural consequences of crucifixion were taking its toll, God the Father was pouring out his undiluted wrath against sin upon his own Son. Imagine the pain in both the heart of the Father and of the Son. As the Father separated his life-sustaining, hope-filled, protective presence from his Son, with whom he had been one since eternity past. In its place, an avalanche of demons in crazed fury descended upon his innocent frame. The terror Jesus felt overwhelmed him with the guilt, fear, condemnation, and the hopelessness of all mankind. As he hung on the cross, he gasped with horror, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, verse 46. Do not forsake me, O Lord, O my God. Be not far from me. Psalms 38, verse 21. Be not far from me. Psalms 22, verse 11. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. Psalms 22, verse 14. He was experiencing something that no other human would ever experience. This leads us to our next fact, which amidst all the blood and gore in Mel Gibson's movie may have been lost to most viewers. Jesus' anguish of heart was far greater than his physical pain. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly than his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground, Luke 22, verse 44. Jesus actually started to die the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane. While praying, Jesus' blood vessels were rupturing in his sweat glands and he began to sweat drops of blood. This rare phenomenon is called hematidrosis and it gives us a narrow window into the severe stress that Jesus was experiencing. While enduring this mysterious pain, he was betrayed, stripped naked, slapped about, jeered at, spit upon, flogged mercilessly, had his beard plucked out, endured a thorny crown crushed into his head, and then was subjected to crucifixion. This made his agony worse, but it was not the cause of his death. Jesus said in John 10 verse 18, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on myself. Here again is a quote from the classic book, The Desire of Ages. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. 
The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of his father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. To illustrate how physical pain can become relatively less important, suppose you are scuba diving 25 feet underwater, exploring a cave. You hear a thud behind you, and as you turn to the opening of the cave, you see that a huge rock has fallen and covered most of the entrance. Only a narrow opening is left, too small for you to fit through without injury. You know you can signal for help, and help will come, but your tank suddenly malfunctions, preventing you from taking in another breath of air. You quickly realize that unless you squeeze through that opening immediately, you will not make it. You know that squeezing through the hard, rough rock will cause tearing into your skin, but your need for air surpasses any other concern. You struggle, scraping against the rock, injuring yourself to get through the hole and back to the surface with only one thought, I need to get air. Jesus found himself hundreds of feet underwater, as it were. His father withdrew his loving, life-giving presence, even as demons overwhelmed him. It was worse than a slow drowning. In Psalm 69 verse 2, we find a moving insight into Jesus' suffering. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. In Jonah 2 verse 5, we read from the new ASV version, water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Jesus endured a drowning, a desperate, painful grasping and gasping for God, his heir. As Jesus breathed his last, he exclaimed triumphantly in faith, it is finished, John 19, verse 30. Although Jesus could not see beyond the grave, he proclaimed in faith that his fate was in God's hands. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, Luke 23, 46. He trusted the Father's heart to his last breath, despite the darkness of despair that engulfed him. Later, when the soldiers came to break the legs of the three victims on the cross, they found that Jesus had already died. When they thrust in a spear into his side, out poured blood and water, evidence that he did not die from crucifixion, but from a broken heart. Jesus had the power to save himself Jesus was still God as he hung on the cross. He was still the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, and he was the creator of all things, including the creator of the people torturing him. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Colossians 1.16 By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalms 33 verse 6 Yet he did not use his divine power to save himself. Imagine the temptation amidst intense suffering to help yourself when it is in your power to do so. With a flick of a finger, with a single word, or even a simple thought command, he could have crushed his tormentors and removed himself from all danger. Jesus could have left us and this rebellious planet to our own misery. He could have returned to his Father to be adored by the hosts of heaven. Through the jeering, taunting mob that surrounded the cross, Satan's temptation was fierce. Come down from the cross and save yourself. Mark 15, verse 30. But he didn't. He came to save them, even though they rejected and despised him at whatever cost to himself. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed that he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. What would have happened if he had opened up his mouth? Jesus' death brings life to you and me. All sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Because you and I have sinned or broken God's law, a death sentence hangs over our head. Jesus, our Redeemer, has taken your sentence upon himself so that we would be free as we accept Jesus as our God, our Lord, and our Savior. Our death penalty is abolished. Our condemnation is removed. Our guilt vanishes. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, Galatians 3.13. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 1. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 1 5. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. 1 John 5 11. In place of the wrath of God, we can receive the gift of eternal life. Jesus' death is evidence of God's love. Jesus did what he did because of his amazing love for you and I. God the Father sent his beloved son Jesus to do what he did because of his amazing love for you and I. It is a spectacle for the ages. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3:16. His love for us is beyond comprehension. Friend, as we have seen, Jesus was so much more than just a martyr, and yet we have only scratched the surface of this amazing topic. I encourage you to think and study more deeply about what the death of Jesus means to you. My hope is that we will listen to John the Baptist when he exclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John 1 Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and share it. Subscribe if you are new and click on the notifications icon next to the subscribe button so you don't miss any of my future uploads. Also check out my other videos on my YouTube channel. May Christ Jesus inspire you as you seek to know the truth that sets you forever free.